Okay. Hi everyone, it's Sarah Lise. I'm here with Lucy Davis and Balanced Toe BT for short. And today we're tripping on the Trinity. We are three energy workers and leaders in the new earth movement of embodying the new earth on planet earth in Gaia. And so I'm here with them and we're tripping on the Trinity today and we're just gonna have a conversation and we're just gonna enjoy our time together and it's gonna be fabulous. Okay, so I would love BT for you to introduce yourself and then Lucy, go ahead after that. And then we'll just start talking. It's, these are consensual conversations. So, you know, anything that you speak here on camera, just know it's gonna be televised because I'm not editing it. <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind while you're talking. If there's something you don't want anybody to know, maybe you just don't wanna say it, you know. But here we are, you know, speaking truth. We're, we're spitting truth here. Like that's actually why we're here. And because there are so many conscious people right now um, on the planet and a lot of us don't talk. And so we're giving ourselves an opportunity to really step forward and, and speak together. And I just love having conversations with awesome human beings. So here we go. Balance toe, you're, you've got the flow. You're talking stick, where's the talking stick? All right. Well, I tell you what, uh, I'm glad to be here with everyone here. And let me give you just a little bit of background about who I am and my belief system and where we're going. And I'll try to make it short, but not too short. So at least you understand. Uh, first of all, my, my family is from Northern New Mexico. We're Pueblo American Indians. My family left the reservation in the early 1920s to hold on to the sacred medicine and traditions within our family. We are the Rainbow Clan of the Piwalatha tribe, which currently today, because of the name change, the, the religious aspect changed it to Picaris because our name was so powerful. Piwalatha means feather bunch flying back to the cosmos. And we believe everybody is an angelic being here to experience the 3D, 4D world not only in the physical shape, but also within the spiritual entity that rests within our heart where our spirit lives. And so my family has been involved with two aspects of what we see today. My dad was the very first constitutional sheriff in the state of New Mexico. And according to Paul Harvey, for those of us who remember Paul Harvey, uh, he was the very first constitutional sheriff located here in the United States. And that basically means that he kicked out all federal agencies. Nobody could come into his county without permission. Nobody had the right to issue citations, anything of this nature. And so on the other hand, my mother, which technically is not my mother, but it's the individual who, who I was raised with. She was a deep state politician from the early 60s all the way up to 1997. And so my journey has been very interesting within the aspect of life, uh, understanding the spiritual entity within us. I'm what they call a walk-in. My grandmothers called me that. When I was born, I stepped in at the actual time of breath. Not, I was never in what one would say, your mother's womb. And wow. so when they laid me upon her, I broke out in hives like an individual would do if he had poison ivy. Uh, they took me away. They didn't know what was going on. A couple hours went by. I was back down to normal. So they went to feed me with breast milk. And her breast milk actually burned my lips and my throat and almost killed me. And so that's when my grandmother stepped in who have trained me in the tradition of the ancient ways within our tribe and knowledge. And they said, no, he's a walk-in. We know what he's here to do. We're going to take over. And so from that time forward, I was trained at the age of five as soon as I could communicate. And so I've learned the, the aspects of traditional ways versus the ways that we see of today. And also the understanding that the American Indian was actually the first socialist experiment here in the United States as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that we see that we take for granted that we're unaware of, but at the same time, there's not an American Indian reservation in the United States that is truly a sovereign nation. And I've challenged these individuals that are business councils in every aspect to prove me wrong since the 70s. And nobody has been able to even step up to the plate to address that. And so the reason, again, is because of the control factor that they've established with the American Indian as a socialist agenda. And so today, 
we would do a lot of spiritual courses uh, dealing with everything from sex, shame, and relationships to the areas of medicine wheels, the sacred ley lines of, of, of our earth, and, and different aspects of that. Uh, we communicate with the little people. We communicate with the fairies. We have songs in our tradition that go all the way back since the beginning of time. Uh, we believe in the giants. We have actual evidence of the giants within our family traditions. And so there's a lot of things that, that we go through with the knowledge, but don't have the actual verification or proof. And that's something that I always like to, to tell people is I'd be more than happy to debate with anybody, but I'm going to show you where the evidence lies. What you do with that evidence is what you do with it. You either respect it or you disagree with it. And either way, it doesn't affect me because again, it's your own spiritual path that you're on. I'm just here to, you know, bring that information out. And so that's kind of what we do. We, we traveled with Sarah Lee and a group of other individuals uh, all through Peru. Uh, we've done all sorts of stuff. We went into France and, 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 and actually I, I, do believe I was the first American Indian shaman to actually smudge the Monaco race course. And so right before the race. And so that, that to me is, is like really serious because I'm an old car buff lover. And I think it's from the past lives that I've had. So good. And just enjoy that kind of energy. So, but there's, there's just so much that we do. Uh, I could go on for hours and days, just like I'm sure each one of you could. And at that same time, you know, we're here to share, you know, what we're looking at for the future of this planet. And so I'm going to turn it back over to you and, and go ahead and let our next speaker speak. How's that? I just want to say, how tall are you, BT, and how big are your feet? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm six foot six. I have a size 16 foot. My grandmother was six four. My great grandfather was six eleven. And so we're, 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 you know, we're tall natives. Some people call us giants, but at the same time, we are very large. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to just put that in there because, you know, yeah. when I get to me, then it'll make sense. Go ahead, Lucy. I love you and your energy. Honestly, I really do. I, it's just beautiful and it's my pleasure to meet you. Honestly, it really is. Um, so everybody can probably tell from my accent, I am from the UK. Um, I live in a place called Surrey, which is just outside of London. And um, I met Sarah Lee in Glastonbury a few years ago. And I was at that point just figuring out what I'd been put on this planet to do. I knew I was a healer. I knew I was an energy worker. I knew I did some really quite cool, profound healing, particularly through quantum. But really, um, since we met back in Glastonbury a few years ago, my journey has completely catapulted to working on the grid, as well as very much working with humans. It's, you know, I work with humans during the day, help them step up and step through their emotional trauma, which is holding them back. And at nighttime, very much in my um, super conscious state, I am working on the grid. Um, and the reason my main driver at the moment um, is I'm very much working with the children that have been trafficked um, and it's a huge passion of mine. I, I never knew why. Um, I used to work on the trading floor seven years ago and I never knew why I wanted to feed underprivileged families fruits and vegetables. I wanted to help children that had been trafficked and I didn't ever really get it. But actually now I've gone through further on my journey. I feel so connected to what goes on underground very much on top of the ground, but very much underground. Like I see, feel and hear what goes on underneath. I do a lot of healing work, what goes on underneath and in the tunnels. I've been spending a lot of time in my super conscious state in Melbourne recently. Um, and like I said to you guys, just before we started recording here today, another earthquake has gone off just outside of London, um, an earthquake. And as we all know that it isn't an earthquake, it is, you know, some work that's taking place to make sure that things are being cleansed over here. And we are just about to step back in to the second phase of lockdown, which obviously, as we know, means mm -hmm. that there is extra cleansing work to be done over here. So I physically in my day to day, I very much help people. I'm a very much a human to human person but very much at night in my, in my sleep state, that's when I do the work on the grid. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's Busy, great. Girl. <laughs> Busy girl. Busy girl. Busy girl. I can relate to that one. 
And um, for those of you, oh, sorry, did you want to say something, BT? I was just going to say, for, for a lot of people who don't understand the grit work, it, it is one of the most important aspects of creating a new energy here on our planet. Mm -hmm. So I think people who are new to this you know, need to understand we're not just out there setting stones or doing you know, energy work. It, it, it's something to balance within our, our earth spectrum within all dimensions, not just the 3D, 4D. Right, absolutely. Um, and so for those of you who have never been uh, connected to me, because I know that Lucy's gonna put this on her channel as well. My name is Sarah Lee Shakina Sophia, and I'm a doctor of vibrational medicine. And what I have spent the last, let's see, I would say 10 solid years doing is working directly with the earth grids and the ley lines and the stargates of the planet. And uh, a little history on me would be that I was sold pre-birth into a secret military program by my father. He was a top secret engineer in the Navy. And so for me, I was human trafficked most of my life. Um, I am a, a survivor and a thriver from that environment. Um, I have dismantled the MK Ultra programming within myself. I've developed a, a full spectrum healing, which is a healing system that I developed uh, to assist in uh, dismantling mind control programs and working with victims and survivors of satanic ritual abuse and MK Ultra mind control programming, veterans, PTSD all the different levels of um, how someone is in a imbalanced state and restoring them to their original divine blueprint. So that's a little bit about me and um, yeah, it's a lot. So BT and I, um, we, we have done some good work together and Lucy and I met in Glastonbury. So I've had direct experience working with these two individuals and I really wanted to bring us together and I want to have more of these conversations because I feel it's super important for all of us who are connected, who do this work, for people to really have an opportunity to uh, witness it, talk about it, receive it, understand it because they themselves, you yourself have the abilities within you to do this work as well and to assist and support the new earth frequencies coming online and us establishing the the new the new world that we are putting into um, existence. I guess that's the way to put it. Um, and support uh, you know humanity and Gaia with this transition because we are in a massive shift. There's massive amounts of cosmic energy being deposited on the planet on a consistent basis. Excuse me. And on top of that, we have the great awakening, which is that we are moving into a new phase of reality. And at the same time, there are powers that were that would attempt to uh, thwart those efforts and, and those receiving of that energy so that humanity can be free in their consciousness and, the, and as sovereign beings. Um, and so I want to talk about, I want BT to actually tell the story because it ties in with what I did last week. So I want you to tell the story. So I started, hold on, I wanna say this. I opened a portal in, here we go, here we go. I opened a portal in Kauai in 2012 on the winter solstice of 2012. So December 21st, 2012. I was in Cloud Forest in the Kalalau Valley at the top of the Kalalau Valley on a six foot wide ridge with 10 people, 3,000 foot drop on both sides, huddled in a two person tent on a six foot wide ridge, chanting and doing, and there was a galactic earth peace treaty that took place 60 ships in the sky in the middle of the night, okay, you know, full on like transformational reality happening on this slippery, wet, muddy slope. And we literally like had this little tea light candle in our hands and we were chanting all night for hours and like just watching everything happen. It was so crazy. So that's how it started. And then of course, moving through all the things that we've done and then BT and I 
were in the Sacred Valley together for two weeks in Peru in 2017 before I met you, Lucy, right? And so I want BT to share our experience on in the middle of Lake Titicaca on the Peruvian Bolivian border in the center of Lake Titicaca. Go. Okay. The whole thing. Just your your perception of what happened that day. That was anyway. It, it, it was a cra <laughs> it was a crazy journey, so to speak. Okay. I mean, I think the most important part of that whole journey was the fact that the shadow energy within the, the continent there of Peru knew we were there. And we were followed by police, followed by military. They even at one point told me I couldn't wear my sacred robe and, and that I needed to undress. And I basically told them I don't have anything under here. And they kind of freaked out. So they, they you know, they kind of let me do what I needed to do. However, we were followed and harassed and all this kind of stuff. And so at each of these sacred points, but the biggest one that we had again is what, is what Sarah Lee had just mentioned was at Lake Tinkaka. So it was Sarah Lee. We've Carla. already done Machu Picchu Peru at this point. Yeah, we've done How most. Yeah, the we've whole, done most everything all, already at this point before Lake Titicaca happened. Okay, go ahead. And so we're we're out there on this on on, on this boat. Okay, five hours to get out there. Five hours, and 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 this boat wasn't your typical boat. It was a boat that you know the motor was like you know from the thirties. With you know, I mean, it was smog city inside there. We almost smelled like gas. This was the poison from within, the carbon monoxide. I mean, I mean, it was crazy. However. We got all the way out there to the center of the lake and we just stopped and we got up on top of the boat and I had brought some some crystals that uh, Carla and I had dug up personally in Wyoming and they're very sacred crystals they're made out of selenite and so we brought actually 25 pounds on this journey to Peru and we buried all of them except for probably maybe four or five small pieces which we gave to some of the members that we were with. And so when we got out there, we did our prayers and then I do our 13 moon medicine wheel. And so I took 13 stones, dropped them in the water with prayer on each one around the boat. Once we did that and the final one was dropped, the water actually started boiling and bubbling as if it was on fire, like there was heat. And we all kind of just kind of went, okay, well, you know, we've seen a lot of things in our journeys because that's what we do. And so we kind of looked at that, we, you know, finished our prayers and our blessings and we moved on to the island where the three of you went up and you closed another stargate. And so the next morning we come back and we're getting ready to come back. And I really got to give the girls kudos because it was the most rainy, treacherous day. And these hail, three went, dude, hail. Hail everything. And these three hail, went okay. On horses I have it on like film. Nutrition, I kid you not. I mean, I don't know how they got there and got back safely, but they did. And anyhow, we got back to, to where we were staying in our humble abode and we got ready to leave. And so we get on the boat again. As soon as we get on the boat and we go about maybe a quarter of a mile, the water turned pitch black. The day before it was as blue as, as the ocean is. I mean, and like the sky still. Blue and still and as soon as we got out there to a certain point it just turned black the waves were choppy our boat was so bad that at one time it was sideways and the water was coming in the windows from the bottom because we were like in the water okay we were holding on dude yeah yeah holding we were holding on to the boat we, like, you know we were we were not only in prayer but we were definitely you know had some seat belts on so to speak <laughs> And, and anyhow, we, we, we got all the way through this. It took us like seven to eight hours just to get back, like back to where we, were, we started from. And we finally get back. We, we get out of our boat and there's two military guys, one on the very end of the dock and one on the dock. And they're looking at us. And we get off the boat and I speak Spanish, but it has American Indian kind of thrown in it, but I can converse with pretty much any of the Spanish speaking nations. And the guy says to the other guy, he says, I'm going to go down here on the boat. And so as he comes closer to the boat, he asked the, the, our, our captain, which was really, <laughs> a really sweet guy. He asked the captain in Spanish, on the estas la máquinas? 
In other words, where are the machines? And the guy didn't know, he says, there's no machines here. I mean, there were just the people. They only came just the people. They didn't bring anything. And at that time, the guy starts like ripping up the cushions, looking throughout this whole boat, because what we had done is we had sealed and, and encased the negative energy that's at the base of Lake Titicaca. And so as we're slowly moving out, Spirit tells me, touch the man at the end of the dock. And so I were going by him and, you know, I'm one that always listens to spirit, even though sometimes it could be scary as hell, you know. BT looks but, back and he's like, and so I like, I see, I see and, what's going on, bro. All of a sudden, <laughs> the man's cloaking device disappeared and you could see a reptilian individual right in front Slits. of us. Yeah, slit eyes the whole nine yards. Okay, so... We all get gold back. eyes, like bright yellow eyes with freaking slits, Lucy. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was just amazing. And so we get on land, okay? We were off the dock. We get on land. And this is daytime. But as soon as we touched land, all the electricity in this area went out, all of it, okay? And it stayed off for three days until we left. Literally, I mean, we had no showers, we had no lights in our hotel room, we had no lights anywhere. And we all knew what was going on. It was just the spiritual energy, the ability of what we did, the uh, ley lines that were fixed, and the ley lines that were closed. And so it was an amazing journey, you know, throughout this whole process. But at the same time, it was something that's a never ending process, because no matter where there is light, there will be shadow. It, 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 it's, it's a constant understanding of, of, of the differences of energy. And so we continued on this journey and it was like some of the most amazing things that we saw uh, and, and actually did. We, uh, like I said, mentioned earlier, we, we buried crystals throughout the whole country of Peru and they're in a position now to be able to receive things, to be able to understand the, the changes of life, so to speak, that we're coming through, through this new light source energy that, that's surrounding our planet, uh, through the cosmic energy of, of above, one would say. And so it was an amazing journey, but I tell you, everybody that we was with, and even some of the people who weren't with us, our energies were such a high frequency that either people loved us or they hated us. I mean, there was, there was some rude remarks said to some of us, you know, just out of the blue for no reason. And like there full was full tax, more, just like. Yeah, yeah, just, just the tax. And then in some so, cases there were just, you know, the pure love and, 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 you know, the ability to recognize light source energy. And so it, it was, it was one of the definitely highlights. Another highlight there was when we were at the bottom there in the cave and we were at the bottom at the, at the, the moon cave. temple in yeah. Machu Picchu. Yeah. That has like the meteorites. Yeah. The stones in there. And, and I tell you, it was all the time that we were there, we were on under constant attack. Uh, anything that we try to do, they try to prevent us. For two and a half weeks. Yeah, for two and a half weeks. And then it was even to a point where the shadow energy didn't even try to infiltrate our own group, group. of individuals, as, as shadow does. And some people were able to fend it off while others couldn't. And so they were kind of, you know, having some difficulty. There was within, one particular Yeah, human. within the, yeah, within their space, their space of energy. And so we had to really kind of clear those energies and, and, and move into a higher source energy. Uh, there was just so much that went on in that short, which seemed like a long period of time, but even though it was a short period of time, but what it did again is it, you know, it cleared the energies, not of just the past that we know of today, but the past prior to. And so the, the, the mystery schools and things of this nature, were able to re-energize themselves. We actually took these crystals and placed them in between some of the rocks of the mystery schools that were laser cut, as we all know, not uh, chiseled, and, and things of this nature. And so every place we went, we left a, a spiritual essence of pure light energy, one would say.
And so it was, it was an amazing journey and, and we have much more to do, much more to do in these journeys around, uh, around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think some of the most important things that we do is clearing the, the, the negative energies of, of like the Colosseums that the Romans had where they killed and things of this nature. We mm -hmm. did that throughout France when we were there, uh, back, back in the day too, Carla and I, and, and, and one of our friends. Uh, and so there's so much that is happening, not just on an individual basis, but as a collective. And within our energies, the, the three energies that we all work with, you know, some of us don't understand them yet, but in our traditional light source energies, there are three main ones. We have purple light source energy, which is of source. In other words, creator source energy. Then we have blue light energy, which is the collectiveness of consciousness energy. And then we have the white source energy, which is the individual consciousness. And some may say it's Christ energy. Okay, I'm just throwing it out there because some people understand that. And in our traditional belief, we have what is called the peacemaker, which other people would call Christ. And so in our tradition, the white source energy was the actual energy that allowed the humans, okay, in the 3D, 4D realm to be able to accept free will choice. And that's where the light source energy is. I mean, it, it's the, one of the most important, but it's one of the easiest to be deceived as well. So I'll turn it back over. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so my experience <laughs> of the same thing, the same trip. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. I feel like I need a glass of wine for this rather than my water and my herbal tea. <laughs> right? It's an adventure. It's an adventure. That's it's a it. movie. Love it. Well, well, you'll just know next time to have a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I do have two videos on my YouTube channel from this experience that we filmed. And I, I did the best I could with cutting it and whatever and editing it. But... <laughs> You know, it's just a, on my phone. So, but regardless that you can see some of this in action, it's kind of funny. Not the ceremonies themselves, but like around the ceremony, you know? So I had been in Jamaica for my birthday. And three days after my birthday, that morning, I was boarding the plane to Peru to go meet the group. I hadn't met BT yet. Um, and my dad decides to die. <laughs> Thanks, dad. <laughs> Thanks a lot, pal. You just freaking die. Okay. So I'm standing there for 10 minutes on the phone with my sister and that the plane is waiting for me. Like, waited for me to take off. Like that's amazing in and of itself. But it was like, my dad just died. I'm standing in line to board the plane. And my, I get a text from my sister saying, dad just died. I'm like, what the fuck, what? So this kind of adds an element, right? To the whole situation. And this is why I'm mentioning it because of course I'm just like, oh, and I have to get on this plane and be calm and to, you know, together and so I'm traveling and I have to go through the US from Jamaica back to Peru, right? And I mean, they're right next to each other, kind of. You know, they're not that far away from each other. I had to go back into the US and I was not happy about that, let me tell you. Back into Miami and I had to drop off one of my suitcases and ship it back to Ashland and then get on a Spirit Airlines or whatever to get back to Peru because they wouldn't accept my, all my traveling stuff. So I had to like repack all my shit and, and then do all this and then get on a plane to Peru. So I was like scrambling all day. I get into Peru and I'm meeting the two guys that I had brought, that I was bringing and they were meeting me in Lima. And the guy starts grilling me about my past. And I'm like, dude, my dad just died. You think I really, I've been traveling. Do you really think I want to talk about this right now? Like, can I just, 
lay here, please. So that's what, and then the next morning I met with the other guy who became the uh, in the in the situation. So for the first how many days was that BT? Like four days or five days? It was complete, like yeah, yeah definitely some freaking insanity, dude. The sky was coming at me from all angles trying to make me look like I had done something to him or I'd taken advantage of him. I seduced all this crazy. I never even hugged the guy and he had accused me of seducing him. It was bad, dude. It was like, it was so ridiculous. I was like so pissed because my dad had just died. Right. So that night I meet BT. We have this despacho ceremony upon arrival. I'm exhausted. Everybody's tired. We're like, oh, do we really need to do this for five hours? Whatever. It was a million hours. We we're all sitting there. We're like, <laughs> it's just crazy, dude. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to try to like speed it up because there's so much that happened. But anyway, the next morning, I came into the kitchen and BT is standing there and I'm like, okay, dude, I got to apologize to you. I'm triggered, you know, blah, 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 blah. and then he starts channeling my dad <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God, I was just like fire dragon breathing. Like I was pissed. I was like, dude, you need to apologize. Like I was talking to my dad, like you owe me an apology for this shit. <laughs> like. I was, it was, he was finally on the other side and I could do something about it. You know what I mean? And like, so just this whole thing and BT is like, I'm here to support you sister. So our, my dad was on the trip with us and he got to see, he got to climb Machu Picchu and like do all these things with us that he wouldn't have been able to do. Right. So it was like a really cool experience in that regard. But what happened is when he passed, I cleared the curse off the family and I did all this stuff. And then of course we went under attack because the Dracos or whatever, the dark Lords in the DNA were trying to find a new host, right? They were trying to come back to me and I was like, not having it. And, and so we were being, the Dracos were just upset and they were just coming through people and they were attacking me and attacking everybody else. And it was just, it was a mess. It was a total mess. So we finally got our shit together enough to figure out like how to group together and stay together except for the one guy. So we were all kind of in agreement at one point. Like we all like BT and Carla were going to leave. They were like, we're out. We're, we're not doing this. This is bullshit. <laughs> They were like, we are not having this. This is crazy, cray, cray, cray. Um, no. And I was like, and so we all sat down and had a meeting in this Peruvian family's house. I mean, bless their hearts, the children, just everybody. It was just, it was incredible. And the two guys decided to gang up on me, right? And then Ahmed came to my aid and then BT and Carla started to figure out that I was actually innocent on some level and that I wasn't actually, but I was triggered. My dad just died. I was like losing my shit, right? I was trying to hold it together, but it wasn't happening. <laughs> and so we all came to sort of an agreement that we would just, you know, but the one guy, he just wouldn't let it go. And he was making everybody wait. You know, it was just a mess. It was just a mess. So we get to... We, so we do Machu Picchu, right? And we go all the way down to the moon temple, which is on the back side. So we start at seven in the morning, 12 hours. We hike to the top point of Huayna Picchu, which is the highest peak. And we sit on the rocks on the highest peak, like 16,000 feet in the air, okay? And then we go back all the way down Huayna Picchu on the side of the mountain to the moon temple and activated Stargate 5. And this channel, this flood of light was just like <laughs> through the valley. It's just like <laughs> And like BT's getting all these like downloads and these beings are showing up. And it was incredible. It was incredible. This cave was absolutely incredible. And then we had to hike back up. These, and these steps are like this tall 
and this wide on the side of a mountain with no rail, literally, and this, this wide, okay? I think they're a little, 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 little. <laughs> Maybe they're even a little bit small. I mean, they are just ridiculous. <laughs> they're just carved out of a mountain, literally. <laughs> so. My, my 16s, I had it go sideways up. Is that yeah, sideways. We're sideways. He's literally sideways up the side of the freaking mountain. <laughs> it was I crazy. About size five. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, boop, 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 boop. We were like, side. I was sidewaysing it too on some of those steps. We were climbing down these ladders to the different look, like we had to climb down a ladder and our 76 year old guide was like, bah, 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 and we're just like standing there watching him like, oh my God, this guy, he was incredible. He's just like cruising all around like it was nothing. And we we're all just like, <gasps> you know, sweating and like can't breathe because there's no oxygen, you know, it was crazy. So we come up this, we come, so we do this whole ceremony and the guide is like pushing us to go. He's like, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. It's two o'clock, you gotta go, like get out of here because they don't wanna have to bring a helicopter down the side of the mountain, you know, if anybody gets hurt or whatever. So my heart decides to stop eight times on the way back up. So one of the guys, stayed with me and the, but the guide kept pushing me to go and i if i would have just rested for like even 20 minutes i would have been fine but no we could, no that wasn't possible so my heart kept stopping and i had to like stop because i i have an atrial fibrillation i had to literally stop and like reset my heart over and over again it took me two and a half hours to get back up the side of the freaking mountain and, and everyone's waiting for me and they're like, yay! <laughs> I was like, I am not dying on this fucking mountain. Like, that is not happening right now. I was so pissed, dude. I was like, I am making it up this mountain. <laughs> you know, and I feel like it was my dad too, because my dad has an atrial fibrillation, right? And so I haven't really had that many heart problems, but the entire time I was climbing that mountain, it was like, <gasps> and my heart would do these weird things and I'd have to stop and like, just make sure that I wasn't gonna die right there. It was super crazy. But we made it and we had the best dinner that night. Oh my God, that dinner was so epic. That dinner, we ate so much food, it was crazy. And none of us had been really eating because the altitude and the air is thin and like, yes, our bodies were trying to adjust to all the different things, right? So cut to five days later, oh, Amatamuru. Four days later, we go to Amatamuru, which is on the on the shore of Lake Titicaca, near Puno, which is the city there. And did we, BT, did we drive through um, Huliaca that day or the next day between Amatamuru and Puno? I think it was the between yeah. Amatamuru and Puno we drove. Yeah, so. On, the, on March 9th, we went to Matamuru, which is this inner earth temple with giants and, and St. Germain showed up and I got this full download that I'd received part of it in 2010 and then the other part of it, like in 2017, the day before we're supposed to be on Lake Titicaca, right? I knew we had to be on the, uh, there on that day, on March 10th and like this whole thing, right? So I get this full download in Matamuru Amaru, Amaru Muru is really what it is. Um, it's this gateway of the gods. It's this wall in the side of a mountain, literally. Um, it's <laughs> my son. Can you please be a little quieter? <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, this wall in the side of the mountain where the, the, gateway of the gods, which literally was like, uh, you know, this beautiful, like, how did they even carve the mountain? Like, how did they even do that? Like, it's mind blowing, right? And you sit in this little cubby and like, you're in, right? And you're like having all these experiences and crazy, amazing. So I get a download. So that night we go back to I think that, 
I don't know where we were that, that night, but anyway, we, we knew what we were going to do the next day. Right. So we get up in the morning and we go to the lake and we're totally cloaked. We're like, we got a cloak. We got a cloak. We got a cloak. You know, we got to make sure that nobody knows what we're doing. Right. So everything was fine. And the, and the, you know, the, the water was glass literally glass on Lake Titicaca. And even the, the driver of the boat said, I have never seen the water like this before. He was just like kind of blown away at like how peaceful it was, right? And so that first five hours was just like ships, like in the clouds and like, it just, we were so protected. We could feel the underwater bases. Like I knew where the Pleiadian base was and the Zeta base and the Draco, like you could feel where they were. And I was just cloaking super hard. I'm like, oh, and by the way, you had to drive through the city where the actual airport was. This city we got spiraled through the city. Like I was like, we need to get out of here. And I like created this tunnel of light. We got like turned around in the city, like, and everywhere we went, there was trash all over the streets. There were dogs fighting for the trash. There were people on these motorcycles and like demonic, just the entire city was hosted. Like it was crazy, dude. Pitch fucking black, pitch black. And it wasn't just trash, like you would see like on the side of a road. We're talking like three stories tall of trash. Trash. And we're talking like 60 to 80 foot across in some places, and some places even wider. And like we were trying to get through the streets. We were trying to get through there to get out. Like we were, we got spun out and we were like in this thing and we kept going around in circles. And finally I was like, fuck this. And I was like, you know, and like, we, we made it out, you know, I've like created this tunnel and like cloaked us and made this like rainbow tunnel thing. And like we, the guy, the driver finally made his way out of there. It, and it's only a half an hour away from Lake Titicaca, you know? So it's like outside of these stargates are these dark rings, right? And everywhere I've been in the world, that's been the case. Like, there'll be this beautiful portal and then there's this like dark ring or city that right outside that's like just low because they all want to get into the portal right so they're just like they're crowding up around the bubble basically so we go to lake titicaca we get up we go out onto the lake everything's cruising we're cruising we're cloaked everything's so magical and then we get out into the center of the lake and the guy, the driver's like, no policia, police it. Cause we were coming up against the Bolivian border. And so he was freaking out, right? By the way, we had four people that had gone to the Bolivian side to the Island of the Sun, right? Where the Stargate actually is in Bolivia on the lake. And then four of us stayed on this side, in the Peruvian side. So four, so four of us were here and four of us were on the other side. And so we were going to bridge the energy over. So the download that I received is that the cosmic gamma rays were going to deposit and that Lake Titicaca was the largest place to be able to receive, largest body of water that could receive these energies to go into the grid, right? And we were going to rainbow bridge over to Shasta and like do whatever needed to be done from the lake and put it into the Stargate in Bolivia. So Goody and the three boys, that's what I call them, the three boys, they went over to the Bolivian side. So we get on to the center of the lake. We're standing on the top of the thing, the bubbling, like, ring of bubbles all the way around the boat, like in a perfect circle around the boat. And I've got my eyes closed, so I didn't even see this happening. I'm just like doing my thing, right? And we had dropped the crystals into the water. And then, so we, we opened up this portal to allow this cosmic energy to be deposited into the lake. And all of a sudden, I like turned 90 degrees and I was like Antarctica, right? I just had this like moment of like Antarctica. 
So then I turned and I was like, ah, you know, like just pushing energy, slamming energy from source into the Antarctica, just like blasting it. And I, and all of a sudden, like I saw machines underground going crazy, people running down and like, what the fuck is going on? They're like, ah! and I started laughing. I started bursting out laughing. <laughs> and everyone's like, what are you laughing at? And I'm like, the machines are going crazy in Antarctica. I just, you know, whatever. It was just really funny. We all started laughing. We're just like, this is hilarious. Like, absolutely hilarious. So we finished our ceremony and we go back and then we had the like, oh, the most blissful day. Oh, there were clouds with like rectangular ships in the rectangular windows in the clouds. I took pictures of them. Like literally there were beings standing there watching us. We were like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> like totally happening. Right. Surrounded all the way around us. We were completely protected. Yeah. It was incredible. And so the next morning he told you what happened. Like we had this whole thing with the water going black and the hailstorm before we had to go up and close the freaking portal. We came back down, like all the shit went down the next day. And I was like, calm these waters down. You know, I was like, not having this. And we were all like praying like, and then it was like, and then we just cruised right into Puno again. It was so cool. But then we got back to the dock and all that shit went down. Oh, and all the stores were closed. Like the entire tourist harbor was shut down. Yeah. No electricity. At 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Good job. And there were cops <laughs> everywhere. Like just riot gear. Like just everywhere you looked, there were cops. It was crazy. And he was, they were looking for technology. They were looking to see how we could have possibly shut that shit down. And we opened this portal and we just blasted the whole thing. We neutralized whatever dark was there. It got neutral. It just got disintegrated. It was crazy. Uh, underestimate the power of energy, right? Right. And of source energy specifically. <laughs> people that are listening on my channel they you know they hear what I do and they love what I do but a lot of people don't comprehend how powerful this stuff is yeah until you do it until you run the energy and you understand how to direct the energy and you have like protocols and you know what you're doing it's really hard to understand and people are like black shit open like I don't know what I'm doing and I'm Wah! And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> you know, because they don't know how powerful they are. And even on a human level, when you're doing energy work on a human yeah. level, like, this stuff needs to be treated with care, right? Yes. You know, we, we've got to treat it with care. And I often absolutely say people, like, make sure you're in the right mindset. Make sure you trust the person that you're working with right. because you don't know what's going to go in. And you know, when we actually break it down fundamentally and we recognize that actually we are pure energy and we are pure right. source. Yes. It's that point that you recognize that you do need to cloak, you do need to protect, you do need to make sure the person that you're working with is the right, the right person or people. Yes. Because there's so many people that band this stuff around now, because it's kind of fashionable now, isn't it? You know, oh, I'm going to do a bit of energy work, a bit of Reiki, a bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah, they have no idea. <laughs> No. They get themselves in a lot of trouble. Exactly. And this is, this is part of what we need to support in the world is helping to clarify and help people understand like what are the different levels of energy and how they work and what we're using and, and have protocols in place that people can apply to this energy work or to themselves and to this you know, whole system to be able to understand what's really going on because the clearer they become about all the delineations and all the different levels that it's operating on, then they're more likely to uh, uh, know what to look for and how to go about their work, whatever they're doing. But everybody has the capacity once they've activated their own DNA and their source energy and they are, you know, connected 
they have the opportunity and the ability to be able to do this work. It's not like you have to be special. It is just as a human being with light in, your, in the codes in your DNA activated, you are capable of, of affecting multidimensional layers of reality. And we need everybody possible to be able to support this transition that we're in on the earth and all the dark grids and the dark magic being lifted and coming offline from where they've been and, and implemented for thousands of years, right? I mean, it's huge how they took over the entire system and they had it in lockdown. And now that's not the case anymore at all. And they keep trying now to like, it's funny to watch actually. They keep trying to like implement this new dark magic. And I'm like, nope, nope, sorry, nope. And the more you fill in the surface of the earth and the, all those places with liquid plasma light, there's no way for the, the dark to grab on to it. There's no way for it to, to hook in. It's when there's a hole or a space that's empty that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like when the liquid, pla it's different than like rainbow light or source light, it's liquid plasma, it's like a, it's like a liquid. So it fills in and it, it, it's more solidified in a way <clears throat> that it can't, that the energies can't come in and lock in. So in somebody's aura, it's the same thing, right? If you're filling your body with liquid plasma light and you're breathing in source energy and you're really concentrating on filling up and repairing all the holes in your auric field and your energy body in your, in your bubble, right? Then there's really no way for them to get in. You know, there's no way for them to like grab on and grab a hold and host or operate through you. But people don't have any awareness around energy at all because they've never been taught and it hasn't been taught on this planet for thousands and thousands of years. So we're bringing back the ancient future technologies to be able to support humanity coming into their sovereignty for real, like for real, real, you know? Yeah. One of the things too that, that I'd like to just touch base on is sure. most people are aware that the American Indians are supposedly the only ones who are supposed to have feathers, okay? Let them be any type of feather, okay? Well, in our traditional understanding, the feather is like a instrument that is a frequency. Each bird has a different frequency, just like a tuning fork. And so as you use a, a, an eagle feather, it's for strength. You use a macaw feather, a blue one, that's for your spiritual enlightenment. Each of these feathers have a different meaning. It's and a so condor. The, the, the condor is, is one of strength and peace and uniting. And so you have different energies within each of these feathers. And so when the government disallowed everybody to have feathers, what they were doing is taking away the ability of one to cleanse the shadow energy or the negative energies or to utilize positive energies within their healing. And so this is something that most people are unaware of. And so within traditional aspects within our tribe, the feather and stones are what our medicine was that we utilized throughout the beginning of time, so to speak. And so mm -hmm. the, the frequencies that are within every stone have a healing property. Same with, the, with each feather. And think about it. If you're going down, the, down walking your path or what have you, and you find a feather on the road in front of you, how many of you actually reach down and pick that feather up? In our tradition, it's a sign that you're missing a certain frequency within your body. Mm. And so what we do is we pick them up. We always keep a feather, but we'll take the feather and we'll lightly brush ourselves and brush everything away from our body. doesn't matter if it's our head or our legs. And there's an actual process for this that we call feather tapping that we instruct individuals how to utilize. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it's something that most people don't recognize. And we've used it over the years with people who have been abducted, people who have gone through a lot of trauma uh, within PTSD, different things of this nature. And it's a very strong healing event. And I think as we look in, into the process of what we're seeing today within the rescuing of children throughout our world, mm. 
the uh, individuals through child labor, sex trafficking, being sold on the open market through Wayfair and all these other places one, you know, one's aware of. That if you can take some, some educational time to learn about these types of healing properties, then we can also help others, not just, you know, one on one, but through many miles of distances away, because again, mm -hmm. the knowledge is acceptable. It's just a matter of if, if, if you're open to it. And so, and it's here, it's here for the purpose of that. And so I think right. that's one of the biggest things that we have to look forward to as we move forward, you know, saving our children. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I want to just mention about that is the work that I just did last week, connecting Kauai Lake Titicaca and this location that I was in, in the Sacred Spring, the condor spirit showed up and spread its wings and protected us. And I had the feather right with me and I had a sacred shamanic tool from Peru that I drilled in quartz that I drilled that had a condor on it that I drilled into the ground and it like lit up the entire grid and it reconnected the three locations of Lemuria. So the Lemurian land got re established energetically, which had not been done, right? Which was mind blowing to me. Like I was like, how has this not happened yet? You know, but you never know what you're going to do until it's happening. And so spirit was showing me, you know, and Condorita, she was showing me all the levels that needed to be handled or that I could assist with right in the, in those moments. And, and through the elementals being freed from entrapment, right, through the, whatever cataclysm had happened and all the, the dark magic that had ensued because of that, that rift. That, so we were able to heal all that land, right, from its original trauma. And so one of the things that feathers really do is they, they heal trauma. As in my experience, that's what I've noticed. I'm a feather priestess. And everywhere i go and, and so of course the cool thing was after the next day of course i received feathers in response right so it's like i get a response from nature like a feather will present itself in the forest to me like random you know like how did that happen but it's a specific type of feather right so i have a box a sacred box of feathers that i receive different than like my owl and my raven and my condor and, and my eagle, you know, like I literally have raven, owl, hawk, eagle, and condor feathers that have been gifted to me from nature and from spirit that were gifted. I did not pay for them. They came to me through an experience and they were like, you know, here, you, this is for you. This is, you know, I've received elk teeth. I've received all kinds of different um, things from the, the, the kingdoms to, sh to, to say to me, to communicate back, like this is medicine and you need to respect it and use it appropriately. And so one of the things with moving forward, when we bring in these alternative healing centers and we create all these places that allow people to really come back into themselves and their sovereignty, right? is that we will be using all the different levels like med beds and, and you know, Native American tradition and you know, shamanic traditions. We'll be using all the different traditions because it's not about one tradition or the only way. That's not gonna work for where we're going. We have to, it's all encompassing. Say that again. It's about merging East and Western. That it's, it's exactly. And North and Northern and Southern, right? Absolutely. So now the eagle and the condor have merged in North America. And I've had a very specific magical experience around that specifically. And when it happened, it was like, <laughs> like all the time. I, I literally watched all the timelines come into my office. Right. And I realized that, oh my God, this is actually happening. Like it was in real time. I experienced it. The magic was so powerful and, you know, it's so much bigger than us. You know, we, we can't possibly, if we're not listening and we're not paying attention and we're not witnessing and observing, then we might miss it. Right. 
but because I was so present with the condor feather in that moment that I realized that the eagle and the condor were in the same space together, right? And I was like, oh, oh my God. I'm like watching all this stuff happen and the prophecy being fulfilled in my office, like in that moment, you know? And I would have never, cla- I would never claim that, right? But it was just like, it happened. And I, you know, I don't know if that's the official thing, but I just know that it happened in my office and I had that experience. And that is what I can, I can bring forward now is that prophecy. And, the, and then also the white buffalo leather that was gifted to me by a Native American chief, right? So all of these things have been gifted to me as I, I hold, what is it called when you, um, I, it's in my charge. Like I, I, I care for these things. Like they are part of um, my toolbox, but I'm really there to care for them. Like I'm a guardian of these, of this medicine, of the magic that it carries. And I think a lot of times people don't respect because they don't have like, for instance, with BT, he has the experience of growing up in a tradition, a magical experience, right? Whereas uh, most, hum- most modern civilization, they don't have that experience. And so bringing back the sacred traditions and the sacred magic to the human is going to be a road. It's going to be a journey. And, but it's what I feel moving forward is necessary in our experience is for us to really honor the sacred and to understand what that means and how to integrate it into our daily lives and to live and move and breathe in through and as source energy expressing itself, right? Yeah, I, I, I think one of the biggest things too is, is that most people forget that we all come from a tribe. You know, it's just not right. the American Indian. We have Celtic, we have all the different right. tribes. And yeah, I come from a tribe. Yeah, and at one time we all had the sacred knowledge. Either for the good or for the bad. But we had the knowledge. And so right. now we've seen all the bad and we will continue to see some bad until everything gets cleared up. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the, the knowledge of the good is coming out and it's basically transcending all of our cultures back to where we came from. We always return. Yeah. Returning and home. Reminded constantly, right? And, it, and it's people like us getting together. There'll be people that are listening going, I'd forgotten about that. And it's not that we're teaching them new, we're reminding them of the old. It's we're reminding them of what is in them innately inside of their beingness, right? Exactly. exactly. And I think, I think language is really important. Absolutely. I, you know, because we've been taught and you have to learn this and you have to do it this way. Actually, that isn't what we've been sent here to do. We've been sent here to remember what our divine mission was this lifetime. Right. You know, and that could be grid work. It could be medicine work. It could be whatever it is for everybody. But it's, it's about activating those remembrance, you know, the, the reminders from the past so that people can get connected to whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing and their own magic, right? Like every single person is carrying ancient magic in their DNA. And once that gets activated, it's like all of a sudden, it's a whole new world opens up to people because they realize that they actually have something to contribute that is innately something that they already know and are a master of. And that's something that nobody's really teaching. They're always saying like, oh, I'm going to teach you all this. And like, you're going to do it this way. And this is the thing, this right? Is the way to- this is the way it's going to be. And this is the mystery school. And this is how it's done. No, actually the mystery school is within you. Yeah. And, exactly. and I'm just here to hold space for that. Like I'm literally just here to hold space and facilitate uh, a container that allows for that to happen. Yeah. And I can sure I can guide you through meditation or whatever, but it's like, you have your innate wisdom within you. And that is not something that I have anything to do with. Like, I don't know what you know. And I don't know what you're carrying in from Atlantis and Lemuria and, you know, Avalon and Egypt and, you know, all Samaria and like, you know, all the different, like the Maya 
culture, like the Mayans, like we all have been in those positions where we've had, we've operated and utilized magic. So every single human being on this planet isn't, there's some new, right? There's some, you know, newer souls that are new to the earth, I should say. Ancient souls, but new to the earth, galactic that are star seeds that are coming in. But we're all essentially not from here originally anyway. So it's like there are the originals that did start, you know, and, and birth and develop divine humans here before the seed was compromised. But the, it's like there's so many levels of history. Many levels, of, nobody levels even of history. Knows. Did you guys hear that? That was so weird. That? that was so weird. <laughs> Are you hearing the feedback? Hearing the feedback? I did. I did for a second. <laughs> but that. But that's how. That's how. That's how. That's how. <laughs> that's weird. There we go. It's that really was bizarre. Whenever I, do, whenever I do Zoom calls at the moment, all of my members say to me. Lucy, you're alien. Because <laughs> every now and again, I just speak and I literally go, I go alien. It's fascinating. How are you going alien? <laughs> well, it, it's obviously the feedback that they're getting, but I actually sound like I'm, I'm oh, an weird. alien. Which we all know I'm hybrid, so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Clearly, I just go back to my roots. I forget <laughs> that I'm communicating human to human. I just go back to my roots for a bit. <laughs> right. That's funny. That is so funny. One of the things when you see when you say that about getting back to our roots in, in our traditional belief, there's a difference between soul and spirit. Okay, a lot of people mm -hmm. just think the soul is is what returns back to source, but in our traditional belief, the soul is only of three D, four D, and so what it does is like in our in our understanding, it's kind of like a thumb drive. The soul is. So you have all your experience here on earth and right before you take that last breath, it uploads into the spirit. And then the spirit, because spirit is of the same vibration of, of source energy, it returns back. See, the soul is of 3D, 4D, low frequency. And so it can't, it can't line up. It's like a record player that's going rah, 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 rah. But if you put it on 78, you hear the music. You follow me? Yeah. And so 78 is like the spirit. And so a lot of people have difficulty understanding that the soul remains here, never leaves. And then the spirit is what returns back. And so when we go back to source energy, it drops off all your thumb drive information into the collectiveness of consciousness. And so anytime you want to return, you have a choice of experiences. And those experiences are what brings you back here to this field. And so each of us, in my traditional belief, have had the experience to come back and help heal, mm -hmm. help utilize. The yeah. And so that's what we're here to do. And I think humanity at this point, you know, just like I'm a walk-in, and I'm sure both of you are walk-ins, we're, we're seventh generational healers is, is what our traditional family would say. And so we come back. Our family looks at us as the black sheep, but we're actually the white sheep. You know, we're the ones who are actually here on a spiritual level to help heal not just the past karma within this tradition of, a, of this family, but also to heal the karma that surrounded the family, which is the collectiveness. And I think that's where a lot of us tend to have difficulty with within the religious aspects. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that sits right with me what you've just explained it truly sits right yeah. yeah that totally resonates i like the the seventh generational healer thing that you just said about um i think that's something that that a lot of people are missing uh in their spiritual like growth or whatever when they're waking up they don't realize that everything that they're doing is affecting the collective, that it's affecting a whole line of generations backwards and forwards. And there, there needs to be a consciousness around that specifically um, because we are affecting all future generations with whatever we're doing, but we're also 
affecting the ancestral lineages and clearing the DNA, you know, from the dark lords and the DNA. And we're doing all that work and the miasms and all the different levels of imbalance that have existed up until this point. Uh, not just our own personal experience, right? And, and so when you start to realize how you are affecting reality, like on an yeah. energetic level, you realize how much responsibility you're carrying as an individual, as a spirit, as a soul, but also as a spirit to do this work, to be able to move this energy out of, and, and lift it off the planet, like literally cleanse it or remove it or transmute it or do whatever you got to do. To, to bring it to the next level where it needs to go. Yeah, it's really interesting because what we were saying earlier, just to loop back about teaching, where we've all been taught that it is an individual lesson, it's an individual life, rather than looking at it from a bigger picture. And right. I've actually had some uh, experiences recently where people have come to me and said, I don't believe you can do this because of, and it's their own personal belief system. So I actually did a video, I filmed it over the weekend about oneness because oneness is a subject that when you understand it, and when I, when I say understand it, I mean understand it, when you really feel it, you don't have this separation. There is right. no separation. I look at you and what I love about you, I know is within me. What I know that I can't survive without the trees. Like it's just a totally different mindset. And I think that's where a lot of the spiritual teaching doesn't actually take us. You know, it's very much, you need to do this. You need to do that. Do the breath work, do the meditation, spend time in nature. You know, that those kind of things and people are expected to get the bigger picture, but actually when you speak to people and you get them connected to, they won't survive without sunshine. They won't survive without a tree. So how can you be an individual thing when actually you're part of a much, much, much bigger picture, but nobody told you that when you came out the womb? Right. Their, their focus was on the individualized expression and you creating your own version of who you are and developing that and that's also very important because when you start out and you come into the world you're actually of this whole thing right you don't have that level of separation and everything in your environment is part of everything else and it takes a while to actually individualize into an individualized expression and some people never actually do that they just become whatever else people want them to be. And they, they, don't, they don't have a, like what their own thoughts are, how they're. So it is really important to have the individualized experience, but then take it to the next level and go back into nature, into the wholeness of all of reality and to feel yourself within that, become part of that so that you understand the whole cosmic picture. So it's like you come in and then you go, you go out again. It's like, you know, Absolutely. the matrix and then. Well, well think of the breath that you're doing right now, okay? A lot again? of us, the breath, you know, we mentioned breath earlier. Yeah. In, in, in our traditional understanding of breath and, and the spiritual aspect versus the 3D, 4D, okay, most everybody out there is probably pretty much familiar with what the term chakra energy is. Okay. In our traditional belief, we don't call it chakras. We just call it energy. Okay. But in our energy belief, we believe that the heart chakra and above is all of spirit energy. Mm -hmm. Everything below is 3d, 4d energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when we're going through growth, most individuals will take a breathing or a meditation seminar or a class or things of this nature. Most every class that's out there teaches you to breathe from the stomach. Think about this. Okay. It's been going on for eons. Yeah. If you're only feeding the 3D, 4D, how are you supposed to raise your elevation to the spiritual level? Through the heart. So, yeah. You have to breathe from within the heart. Right. In the lungs. Okay, the heart energy. And if you just keep, keep that energy when you go into meditation into the heart energy, and you know, take it lower, then you actually feed the spirit energy. Right. Just like salt. A lot of doctors say salt's bad for you. 
salt is the energy or the gasoline or diesel or however you want to look at it for the motor of the spirit. Mm -hmm. When we take away our salt, our, our spiritual energy is weak. Right. Okay? And so the 3D, 4D, they want to teach us to keep us away from salt. They want to teach us to breathe only in our stomach and not in our spirit. Because again, if we breathe in our spirit, then we're going to recognize all this other stuff is nothing but a bunch of BS. And they don't want that. They can't control us. They can't right. program us. They can't design us to be slaves for the entire world or cosmos. Workers. Workers. Yeah. Exactly. So I want to mention something about what you just said about salt, but also um, what occurred to me when you were saying that is that all these things about you, you need to do this. You need to do that. Like, this is that, this is that, this is that. Like, that takes us out of our own wisdom. It takes us away from our innate wisdom that our body is communicating with us. And so as we, like, we need to just recognize that we need to let all that go and start listening to our, our temple, our, our body system, body talk, right? Um, and be able to communicate with our body and allow our body to tell us exactly because our body will tell us where the traumas are being held in our cells on the cellular matrix, right? Our bodies will tell us what minerals we are depleted in and what we need. It's, it, and sodium is one, like the 12 tissue cell salts are depleted in most of us because we have been being bombarded with energy that is a low, extremely low frequency on this planet now for at least a solid 10 years, at least, if not longer. And so as that continues to amp up, what that does is it actually, and when we do multidimensional work, it depletes our core mineral base. And so we need to like reestablish and re uh, figure out what our foundational reserves are because they're depleted in everyone. And so that's a big part of why people are getting sick and why they're not and their central nervous systems are jacked from all the energy that's being bombarded. So there's so many levels at this point that we need to address, right? But if we're not listening to our innate wisdom first and foremost, it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, get through that window right into uh strength and being in our sovereignty because we're listening to outside sources right rather than actually listening to what our source energy is telling us in every moment and and really listening and utilizing that wisdom from our own beingness you know well so, i think i think the ego of the individuals Right. You know, I think all of us, you know, have gone through some form of an ego check mark, so to speak. Yes. You know, we're going through, let it be a young or a middle age or old or, you know, as we transcend, so to speak. But the ego is not a friend of the spirit. The ego right. is, is, is like it wants to confuse your spiritual knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people say, oh, I got that gut feeling. Well, yeah, sometimes it's right, but there's sometimes that gut feeling's wrong, you mm -hmm. know, and it's the confusion that the ego brings in utilizing those energies because, again, just like within our mind, we have our conscious versus our subconscious. The subconscious is our healing technique, which anything we can't handle on the 3D, 4D, it comes in and just basically puts it in there and says, hey, we'll take care of it until that time comes where you can actually address this issue. Where the conscious mind, if it just goes into the conscious, we have people that just go crazy within themselves because they, they can't handle it. They can't handle the knowledge or the understanding. And then they force that, try, that a part of healing among, amongst themselves, and they never can get healed. You know, it's just yeah. like alcoholism. If, if you say you're an alcoholic, well, you're never going to be nothing but an alcoholic. You know, you got to be able to understand yeah. words have power. And you have to understand that since 1828, when the first dictionary ever was created, Webster's Dictionary, first time a word was actually defined in the, all throughout history. And so when you look at the words of 1828 and you look at the words of today, the meaning has shifted dramatically through time, through decades and through space. 
And as we look at our times today, what we say today is actually a derogative term or a bad term of energy that we utilize. And we don't know it because we're not taught words have power. We're right. taught words have meaning. And there's a big difference between the meaning and the power. Yes. Lucy, I feel you bursting with something that you want to share. And you've been listening a lot and just sort of sitting back. So I want to give you an opportunity to have the floor for a while. Because we're just like, blah, 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 blah. so I just want to make sure no, that you feel. I'm, no, I'm, I'm enjoying being able to contribute a little bit on the, the healing side of things and just little bits of wisdom that keep coming through. But it's beautiful to listen to you guys. You know, it's just like, because I'm bringing in some human stuff. Um, because obviously everything that we're speaking about right now is what I do through my self love club, right? right? I've got a seven step process. I break the human being down essentially into seven areas that I believe we need to focus on in our own individual ways. And it's just everything that we're speaking about. I'm like, this is literally just what I do, you know, on a human to human level. And it's just, and the start is what I do when I'm asleep. So it's just amazing. I'm like, I, I love it. I just love it. Honestly, I would love to be in Peru with you two. I really want to go. To <laughs> or Peru. wherever like, we're going to go next. <laughs> well, I, I honestly, as soon as you said Lake Titicaca at the beginning, I was like, this Lake Titicaca has been calling me for such a long time. And as you know, Sarah Lee, I travel constantly. Normally, when, when we're not in lockdown, I'm constantly on the road. Um, as you know, we did some great work it, when I was in Bali in Indonesia. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I'm just listening and like my, my cells in my body are like, it's almost time to go again. Even I though we're know. just about to go into lockdown. But Lake Titicaca has been calling me for such a long time. Like yeah. it really does. I, Glastonbury calls me constantly because I'm very linked to the heart chakra. It's, yeah. um, I know you, you don't know my, my history, but I am so in alignment with the love vibration that's that's what i know my purpose is on this planet is about increasing the love vibration connecting people to that and you know glastonbury has a massive place in my heart yeah obviously like we met there but it just the work that i do there and i've been called to go there on uh winter solstice so i know that i've got interesting to be there. Yeah, i know that i have to be there on that day and it's interesting because three girlfriends of mine that are shamans they've all messaged me and they're like you have to be there individually completely separately and I I've been saying to people for a long time I've got to be there it's interesting because I'm feeling Egypt for that wow um really strongly <laughs> that I have a group of people and we'll all be there for that event it's interesting because Israel keeps coming up for me as well. I think we spoke about this before, but Israel, it really keeps coming you up. You and I will probably do Israel together. Yeah, there's some divine feminine energy there that needs unlocking. Massively. Yeah, for sure. Now that um, the temple has been sort of handled. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. Um, <laughs> you know, the temple. just The temple now. Anyway, so... Where do BT have you gotten any sort of intuition or guidance about your winter solstice this year? Just curious. Well, we're, we'll be in Florida, mm -hmm. and so I believe there's a lot of work to be done right there within that Florida area. Uh, yeah, Stargate I, too is right there too. Also, right there. And since I was a kid, I was always given a uh, an insight of reality that's going to transform you know, transpire over in that area. And so mm -hmm. there's like a, a big energetic shift of tornado energy, so to speak, that mm -hmm. basically the dove will come through. In yeah. other words, the light source energy of spirit will come through in that area and it'll move everything here, I believe, in, in North America. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a lot of work that, that we've done uh, recently, uh, within the last couple of years, Carl and I went down to Serpent Mound and it was kind of a real interesting thing in we ohio were, yeah we were sitting and talking and, and she had this kind of a intuition kind of a dream and that came to her said I, I need to go we need to go to the land of the snakes and she says <clears throat> she says i don't know where the, what it means i says well but it's certain, but it, means, it, means, it, it just didn't bother me one second bother me one second oh here it goes again so mm -hmm. mute and then unmute again and see if that helps.
Okay. And so, and so when we went down to Serpent Mound and, and did the energy work there, it was a uh, tremendous light source energy. And it was really funny because we stopped at this little rock shop right before you get into Serpent Mound. Okay. And we're sitting there talking to this guy and he's like, well, I know some people in Peru. And I says, you do. And Carla and I are both looking at him and he goes, yeah, this guy, he came from Peru and he was a shaman and he came here and his name was Willaroo. And I said, Oh my God. Well, is this the same Willaroo? I pulled out my phone and showed him a picture and he was like, Oh my God, he couldn't believe it. And wow. So we, that's so cool. He kind of hit it off. And so he kind of gave me the insight of the do's and don'ts during their time schedule of opening, so to speak. You know, because a lot of times when we do ceremony, you know, a lot of people kind of get attracted towards yeah. us. Yeah. You know, it can kind of cause some havoc in some areas of energetic if they're not accustomed to the energy fields. And so sure. we went down there and we we opened up, up the uh, the energy there of the of the giant, so to speak, and and cleansed a lot of energies. And then we shut everything back down. And 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 so we've been moving east. And so we went to mm -hmm. Arkansas after that and dug up crystals and, and just enjoyed our time there in Arkansas with some of the rock people and, and just having the ability to, to recognize the, the energies that, that come out of that area itself. And so now that we're moving to Florida, you know, we have a big, uh, big opportunity, not just to help others within the transition from the political standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint, because again, you know, we live in a 3D, 4D world and to be able to live in a 3D, 4D world, there's certain things that have to occur. And this is one of the hard things that a lot of people can't do because they're shunning the forces that are there to help them. And so when I say that, it's like, there's a lot of light workers out there who do work but they don't want to receive anything and they don't want to take anything. And, and, they, and, they, and so they shut down the, the economic standpoint that it takes to be able to do things. And it's right. just not, it's a, it's a lot of people in society. And so, you know, right now it takes money to do things. Mm -hmm. It takes, you know, a determination to set aside our own ego to say, yeah, you know, I do need some money. You know what I'm saying, you know, and so we feel really blessed, Carla and I, that we've been able to help a lot of people within that area as well. And within the new times that are coming within the our, our, the reevaluation of currency on a global basis, there's, there's going to be a phenomenal amount of money that's going to be pushed back into the economy. Right. When you look at it from a standpoint of, of what's going to transition, we look at it from the people that we work with and, and, and talk with almost on a weekly basis when, you know, we, we talk to them about the transition of what's occurring, how it's going to occur, and what's going to happen within these individuals who have bought up this type of currency that is going to be reevaluated. Right. And so what we've found is that here in the United States, the majority of currency people will be utilizing that money to open up businesses. They can't go buy stock. They can't go buy gold. They can't go buy this because it'll throw a big curve into the economic standpoint. And so they'll be able to utilize that money to open up businesses, help others open up businesses, oversee things, you know, give people opportunities yeah. they've never had before. And that's right. one of the biggest that we're working with. We have one individual who is, uh, he's like going to be over a trillionaire one with, you know, pretty much with, with all this stuff happens. And, and his goal for us, Carla and I is to allow us to continue our constitutional teachings as well as helping them within the child trafficking. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to go ahead and establish a, a criteria, so to speak, of assisting those individuals who have gone through that type of a trauma right and the children of today you know have been for the most part have been left in a blind zone you know we know that there's these individuals who are missing we know that there's you know abductions child sex trafficking all these types of things that are occurring but the general population doesn't want to take the responsibility that it's happening right. with the shift yeah and now through you know, the different countries that are being established within this child trafficking to, to prevent it, 
uh, and to stop it, literally just take it away where, where we can heal this, this planet. Because again, the children are our future, no matter how you look at it. It doesn't matter what, what ethnicity you are, they are our future. And it's our responsibility within our generation and your guys' generation, all of us, to be able to take that stance and say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to speak the truth. You might not want to hear the truth and you might be blind to the truth, but it's still the truth. And sooner or later, you or your family could be affected. And that's the biggest problem that we see in society is until you're affected personally right. with your family or your friends, you're quiet, you're taking a nap on the couch, you know, you're going to the football game and cheering on everybody else. And, and, and you know, you're, you're throwing this energy that could actually be used to help a lot of kids. Yeah. And so that's one of the biggest things that, that we're looking towards, you know, to see this currency reevaluated on a global. And we believe it'll happen before, hopefully before the end of the year, but no later than June of next year, because that's the cusp of everything. I think, I think, it, you know, every nation right now is basically in what they refer to as a winding up process. And a winding up process is basically a bankruptcy. And mm -hmm. so a lot of countries are, are, are in this process but the general population of the country is unaware of it. Yeah, so nobody really knows what's going on. <laughs> I've been receiving intel twice a day for a long time. So I'm really up and aware of what's happening and I've personally invested as well. So um, I have to stay on top of it because I am, you know, the, the humanitarian projects that I have ready to go are multiple fold. You know, there's so many levels like, I just heard about the troubled teen industry and how, oh my God, the things that are happening in that regard are mind blowing in terms of the centers and the correctional facilities and all these schools that they've created where they're torturing teens in middle school and up to, as early as eight years old. And it's, yeah. it's mind blowing. Like I just, a whole new level was, presented to me i was being nagged spiritually nagged to watch paris hilton's documentary about her this is paris and i thought why would i want to watch like what and i watched it and it was very well done and she's just a real human being right and she shows all the levels of what happened to her and what and, and what she has been experiencing due to the trauma that she experienced in these teen uh, facilities and what it produced in her as a human being and that she feels responsible for our society and like what has happened now because of that, right? So she's now taking personal responsibility for the, the selfie generation and all the levels that that has created due to her unhealed you know, embodiment basically, and she can't live with it anymore. And she's come to this place where she wants to help as many, you know, children as possible because she sees now how the whole thing, she sees full circle and how she's been suffering from nightmares herself every single night in her entire adult life because of this experience. So, um, you know, and then, so she met with her old, uh, roommates and people that were there with her and they band together and they created what's called a uh, break code silence hashtag and they have websites and it's all about the troubled teen industry that is really prevalent and still working and holding strong right and these kids are getting sexually abused and tortured and beaten and like whoa and a lot of this Place. When I was in um, Sydney, Australia last year, I was working, I was doing some voluntary work with troubled teens. And it, the stories that I heard and the things that I found out was just heartbreaking. Yeah. Heartbreaking. I mean, you they know, cause just... complex PTSD and like abandonment issues and trust issues and like all the levels, right? And they don't develop like normal adults. And, and I think that this is a very focused, intentional thing that they've been doing and creating a money industry out of, right? And these are the places that how they've infiltrated our society and we have to dismantle all of that 
and bring everyone back into their original divine blueprint, into their, you know, it's break, it is embodiment. Of these human, the humanness, it's breaking down that because actually yeah. the humanness isn't what we're actually supposed to do. All we're here to do is love each other and that's the end of it. Right. You know, we, that's what we resonate with. That's what we all go along with. But we're taught behaviors like right. the selfie generation. And we step into that, and that's where we lose who we are as a human being. Right. You know, it's just, I, I, like, it, it, it really hurts my soul. It really hurts my soul when I hear about the children. Um, yeah. You know, like, I'm very lucky. I've never been trafficked or abused this lifetime. I know I have in previous or in other realms, whichever way you want to look at it. But this lifetime, as Lucy Davis, I haven't. And I feel very grateful for that. However, from a very young age, all I've wanted to do is help the children. Right. Because I know and I remember what it was like. You know, and my path has just naturally always crossed with troubled teens. You know, mm. as you know, I'm, I'm massively involved with Freedom for the Children UK. We're doing marches across the UK every couple of weeks right now to raise awareness. And um, to what you were saying earlier, BT, about we have to speak our truth. You know, I'm being held abused left, right and centre by mainstream media and people like that. But I'm still standing up and I'm still going to speak my truth because I know the truth and I know what I know. And just because you're vibrating at a different level to me right now, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means we haven't met where we need to meet yet. Exactly. And I, and I think that's really important for most people is that they're like, no, that can't be true. It's got to be a conspiracy. How many conspiracies do you know that have ended up becoming factual? All of Smoking's them. Smoking's bad. Uh, smoking was good for us once upon a time wasn't it um epstein island was a conspiracy once upon a time like let's let's talk about it you know we need to be breaking down these human barriers and actually stepping into what we're supposed to be and that's love yeah. and when you can step into that you know all there is to care about is the next generation because they carry this forward yeah, yeah. right and, and that's so true because my first experience with with the negative aspects of children took place in the, in the 70s. And what happened in this community in Idaho, uh, there was a young baby who was satanically sacrificed at a gravel pit. And the people that were involved were in the political realm and it was very high up. And the individual who did a bunch of research wrote a book called Baby X about this particular situation. Well, the political people bought up all his books and pretty soon that person was gone. So this, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much. And that always really hit me really strong. And then as I went through life and went through my circumstances of being abducted, I was like, you know, children have always been my path. You know, they'll, they'll never not be a part of my path. And the ability that we touch base on all the time is, is the sovereignty aspect, you know, and we have various aspects of sovereignty, depending on who you are, what country you live in, and, and, and your belief system. And so, you know, those three things are so important within our humane society that we have to be able to, to utilize every aspect of our energy on a spiritual level, on a physical level, to be able to combat all these energies that have been designed to destroy us as individuals. And I think that's one of the hardest things to accept, no matter who you are, where you come from, is the fact that children are abused, children are abducted, women are utilized in sex trafficking, all these things that, you know, we're talking hundreds and thousands of people a year go missing. And there's nothing in the newspaper, there's nothing in the news, there's nothing in this. And for the first time in our generation, we're seeing it being brought out to the light. And it's being made where we can actually, actually heal this, this energy because we're talking about it now, where before it's always been brushed under the table. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating, actually. When you were just speaking just then, um, I kept getting this vision of, um, I think it was about four weeks ago, we did the first one in London um, and 
basically we did this really beautiful meditation to the point that we actually peaked the Schumann resonance because we did, you know, there was people all around the world that got involved in this and we did the same the weekend just gone and it's really rattling people. Mm -hmm. I've had um, maybe three people from mainstream media contact me wanting to interview me. One of the girls um, who heads it up with me um, she was interviewed by somebody in one of the papers here in the UK, The Times, and she's basically twisted it and made it all about QAnon. And we're nothing to do with it. We're nothing to do with it. Like, obviously, there are people that have woke because of the Q movement, and I get mm -hmm. that, and I'm not against it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. However, this isn't about Q. Right. This is about the children. Right. And for me, fundamentally bring it on mainstream media. That's how I feel about it. Because if you want, you know, this is, this is something that you are going to have to cover at some point. Mm -hmm. You might not want to do it right now. It's deflection. It's distraction for whatever your reasons, but this is coming. Mm -hmm. And this is what I keep saying to people is you can keep hiding from it. You can keep calling it a conspiracy, but one day it is going to be on your doorstep. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're going to have no, no, no way of not opening that door and seeing it. Oh, it's blown up. It, the door's been blown off over here. Don't you worry about that. You know, but because we want to do it peacefully, like we stood outside Buckingham Palace with our hands across our mouth on Saturday and the police surrounded me and the other girl that, that lead it, right? Because they're like, we're going to give you fines. We're going to give you fines. But, and I'm just like, It's coming out, mate. Yeah, like, like dude. This has to happen. This has to happen. We cannot go on with this darkness. Yeah. And it's and it's doing those things for me that I get to do the grid work. So where wherever we stand, it's because we're over the tunnels. It's because we're giving Absolutely. the energy to the whilst we're there. You know, and it's just it's time. Right. I want to share something that when both of you were talking that came up for me. So uh, in 2016, I got a client in England, in Glastonbury, who was a survivor of um, the pedophile rings from Peter Giaconelli and Jimmy Savile. Wow. And so I worked with her for three solid months. And then the following winter, when I went back to Glastonbury, I worked with another survivor of this, the child pedophilia like, rings from survivor from Peter Giaconelli and Jimmy Savile. Two survivors. Okay. And during that time, they're both 60 years old. So the, so the dead people <laughs> came to us in our sessions that had like had something to do with the torture of these individuals and asked for redemption and actually showed us the whole system and the whole network and how it worked. And by doing that, we were able to help them move forward and move on. Jimmy Savile also came into the field and wanted redemption and wanted to help to lift it. And also the two people that I personally knew from 2016 that were taken out on July 17th and July 20th, back to back, that were trying to expose the pedophilia ring with Hillary Clinton. And they got part of, they were part of the body count, right? One of them was a super soldier and he was coming out with all this information. So when that happened, I just went quiet. And all, all of us did. We were just like, whoa. You know, we all went silent for, it was a warning, you know, for the rest of us. But then when I traveled to England uh, that fall, then I met this person and we started doing this work. And so basically with those two individuals, I was able to work on lifting the veil and all the dark magic constructs that had held it in secrecy. And, and by them showing me all the levels of those networks and how it started and what they did and all the, just all the different levels, I was able to work with her and lift the dark magic off and off, the veil off, off, off of the human trafficking. That just went weird. Just went weird. <laughs>
There we go. Is it better? That was weird. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. So I was able to do some work very specifically around the energetic constructs of the lockdown of the veil. And I was able to lift it in a way that then it started to get exposed almost immediately. There were all these different things popping up and all these videos. And then a court case came out and like, all of a sudden it was like, pop, 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 you know? And it was in tandem with, so that was like the fall of 2016. And then in the, in January of 2017 was the executive order to end human trafficking across the planet. And it was like, boom okay here we go you know it was like all of a sudden there was a, a public awareness around this right and i knew i was like okay it's on <laughs> you know like here we go there's no going back there's no turning back and so literally then the following fall i worked with another individual and her and i just went to work and we just like <laughs> just like in her own personal story, but also on the levels interdimensionally where we could lift all these frequencies off and all the dark magic sigils and all the spells from sacrifices and all the places. And so from that point, I've basically been working nonstop on, you know, repairing all the levels of this. Um, and then, you know, from that, the rescuing of the children started and you know what I mean? So it's like, in my personal experience, I am directly connected to what's happening. And I think every single person has been contributing, like all these people are contributing in all these different ways. That just happens to be my contribution. But we've all come to this place on the planet where uh, it has to be exposed. It has to come forth up and out in order for us to transition into the next level of awareness. And, and it, there's no way around it. There's going to be an exposure of all this information. And the fact that they're trying to close it down and stop it every five seconds, it just goes to show you that it's real. And so anybody that's at this point saying it's a conspiracy theory or whatever, it's like, really? You need to do your research because there's plenty of information out there for you. There's pictures with kids with panda eyes, you know, like you can't, you can't, you can't make that shit up. But some people just don't want to see it. They, yeah, they don't they want to see it. They don't want to see it. You know, they just don't want to see those. it. But that doesn't mean it's not real. You know what no, I mean? I, I'm with you, sister. Yeah. <laughs> So sister, as sure. a collective, though, there's going to be a lot of us that come forward that really want to uh, bring forward this the piece about the healing tones and the healing patterns and the protocols for this collective, for the for the, whoever's been human trafficked, whoever's been a part of that system, whoever's left it, who has survived. Now you got to remember a million children in Melbourne you guys so far a million children in one city wow that's not the rest of the planet that's just one city underground and and do we know if those children are alive probably not most of them have not survived that's just the bodies likely so we have to think about that and think about how many human beings we're talking about here and the souls of those human beings and what has happened. And so soul level of like bringing that stuff and clearing home and all of those souls get addressed and like they have an opportunity to do whatever they need to do for themselves. And that's been a huge job. Just that, you know? So, we are going on two hours and 10 minutes and I'm going to say we can have a part two <laughs> because otherwise we'll be talking all day. No, that's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easy it's to do with us. You know? I'm like, wow, well, where did that two hours go? I know. It's just a, such a pleasant conversation. It's beautiful. I'm so it's grateful that we are here together and that we, you know, BT, thank you for just having the inspiration of, 
wanting to connect with Lucy and like just it happened. Bing! <laughs> well, thank Bye. you, honestly. Thank you. I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure, honestly, to have spent time with both of you. Yeah, you know, definitely. Really, I look forward to whatever adventure we go on because we're bound to, right? Yes, <laughs> for sure. Let yeah. me get my table back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I think we're going to go on an adventure together. For oh, sure. for sure. Oh, we're 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 making it happen for sure. I know. Oh, yeah. I really, honestly, BT. I I really just I want to be around your energy. You know, I do. <laughs> I'm like there. Uh, you want to give him a big hug? He's such a good I, hugger. I want to. Like, I mean, I'm tiny. I'm like five foot four, so <laughs> I'm going to be like this compared to you. Um, but it's, I just, I feel this really beautiful, calming energy from you. And it's this, this Indian guide that I've got. I'm like, oh my God, I've got my real life one now. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> That's so cool. And I'm looking forward to meeting Carla as well. Yeah, she's awesome, dude. Where is she? Hi, guys. Hi! Hi. Hi. Hi the whole session i didn't want to interfere i just wanted to listen oh i'm so happy to see your beautiful face though Mwah. wonderful to see you guys too oh yes i was listening to the adventures in peru and oh my gosh <laughs> oh, yeah do you want to share your adventure your port your perception i would love to hear that actually my perception was basically everything you you guys talked about and said i mean i don't think i can add anything to that um, you were very right on, and uh, it was just, I don't know, it was a great adventure. Let's yes. put it that way. Some very strange things that happened, and uh, one thing you didn't mention was that on the side of the hill there in Peru were the big letters BT. Oh, in, in, on, in uh, Machu Picchu. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was where we... Uh... It was when we were leaving Cusco to go to one of the other sites. Really? And, yeah. And, and it was kind of funny because I got a, I think I think it was either you who pointed it out or, or somebody else said, hey, there's BT. Hey, I'm I'm and so I took a picture of it and I was like, well, it's just definitely a past life. You know, they, they still remember me, I guess. So yeah. I thought that was so funny. Yeah. I mean, it's in huge, like, like the Hollywood sign, right? I kind of remember that. That was in Cusco. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. That was crazy. It was a wonderful trip in a lot of ways. It was kind of, uh, the energetics were kind of confusing at first. Like you were saying, your dad had passed away. Yeah. And that energy was there. And then the two guys, um, their energy yeah. and the energy of almost not wanting us to be a collective group Right. The divide and conquer tactics that were prevalent. We, we had to come through all of that, but there was a reason for that. Yeah. And also learned a lot about the energies of Peru, which everybody I talk to that goes to Peru, they basically just go for a nice little vacation. <laughs> and they don't quite understand what's going on in Peru. And most people don't right. understand that the the people of Peru never mixed with the people in the mystery schools. The mystery schools were for the avatars. Right. Which were mm -hmm. off-planet beings. Right. And they did mix with the, the Altiplano people or the Plains Peruvians. And most people don't understand that. And, right. And uh, they never crossed with them. They never crossbred. And then also if the avatars ever did reproduce, there was a specific reason for the reproduction. Right. They just didn't have children yeah. and so it was all very interesting and yeah. uh besides willaroo i mean we would be standing one place and i'd turn around and then i'd look up and he would be halfway up the mountain yeah, in, a, in, a, in a blink of an eye waiting yeah. for us. He's just like Phew. and we'd be like wait wait yeah. <laughs> we're not ready for that yeah, you never broke never a sweat. Broke a sweat. Yeah, never broke a sweat. And, and I mean, I'm just yeah. so, you know, I'm, yeah. it was so hard getting up out of the cave of the moon. And uh, I didn't think I was going to make it. Well, I she remember she fell down. Remember she fell down and Off Willaroo, the side of the mountain. And Willaroo had a helper. Yes, remember? I remember that. I actually helped you back up too. I remember uh, Willaroo and I were the ones that brought you back up. 
back up. But I mean, the whole thing was was interesting, very yeah. interesting, but enlightening. And it was something that it's we had to do. Fun. <laughs> it was <laughs> fun. It was a lot of fun. Because we need to go somewhere together again. We need to go do some work somewhere. We got to figure out where that is. Um, we'll get moved. I don't know where you are now, Sarah Lee. Have you moved recently? I'm in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> you're in Portland. Oh, oh, you're right in the middle of everything. Oh, yeah. I'm in the middle of it all. It's fun. Ooh, Grounding it out over here. We're not as bad here in New Mexico and Albuquerque, but we're pretty much in the middle of, you know, that energy as well here, you know. Yeah. It's, so it's, we're it's talking a, about the riots, Lucy. Yeah. yeah, the riots. And Lucy, where yeah. are you? I'm in Surrey in England, just outside of in London. England. Okay. Um, well, we ought to figure something out. We'll get settled in, in yes. Florida. And I, I feel like I'll be coming down there to connect because I have two other people, uh, Sophie, Sophia, Renee, and Sudi. And Sudi's from Florida, and Sophia, Renee, she lives down there in that area. So, and also my friend Sean from Michigan had a house down there. So there's going to be a lot of activity around that Stargate specifically, and I feel like maybe we'll come together there for sure. Let's do we're going to need some of that England energy. Yeah, you might right. Well come you might and and, and Lucy will go anywhere in the world. We will just, you know, she travels all over. I travel. Don't you worry, I travel easy. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it one time doing the um, Egypt trip. And, well, that's the uh, other one that I feel really strongly about for the winter solstice. But, you know, Ahmed, what do you think about Ahmed and uh, him leading another group? Um, I don't want to talk about that on camera, but I'm happy to do that off camera. Okay. Okay. I'm going to wrap this up for, let's stay here for a moment. I'm just going to say thank you everyone for listening. I appreciate you being here. We welcome you to the next conversation that we're going to have. And for now, we're going to sign off and just say goodbye. We love you. Thank you for being here with us. Blessings. Blessings, blessings. blessings.